We go now live to the Zellerbach Auditorium at the University of California with the Berkeley Symphony, and your host is Charles Amerkanian. You described yourself through the media. The media said that this guy's a deranged comedian. I mean, perhaps the sort of classical music world and the conductors who approached you were intrigued by the idea of a deranged comedian writing classical music, but something held their attention once they saw the music. What what was it in the craftsmanship of your work that would intrigue somebody like Pierre Boulez and Kent Nagano? I don't know uh, what it is specifically that they liked about it, but there, there's one thing about these pieces. You can't fake your way through them. There's no way that you can, you can't hide. You either play it right or you play it wrong. Welcome to Zellerbach Auditorium on the campus of the University of California, Berkeley, for a concert of music for a large orchestra by Frank Zappa, performed by the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra. Kent Nagano, the symphony's music director, will be on the podium as we hear the American premieres of three pieces and the world premiere of a fourth, played by a massive orchestra of 111 musicians. I'm Charles Amerkanian, music director of KPFA, along with Catherine Lumens, executive producer of radio station KQED-FM in San Francisco. Well, our program opens tonight with Bob and Dacron's Sad Jane, then we'll hear the more extended work Mo and Herb's Vacation. Then uh, both of these works, of course, are American premiere performances. And then we will hear the world premiere of Sinister Footwear, a work in three movements and one of Zappa's most difficult. And to close, we'll hear Pedro's Dowry, another American premiere. Tonight's broadcast is a production of KQED-FM San Francisco in cooperation with KPFA-FM in Berkeley. Now, Charles, I should mention that this is the fifth and the final program of the 1983-84 Berkeley Symphony season. And this program, as all of the concerts of the Berkeley Symphony this past year, will be heard by delayed broadcast over KQED-FM. And this, this particular broadcast will air on Monday, August 13th at 8 p.m. Catherine, this really is an, an, an historic evening for the Berkeley Symphony. We've got a massive ensemble on stage, the bigger-than-life-size puppets of John Gilkerson and the San Francisco Miniature Theater, a troupe of hand-picked dancers operating these puppets in choreography by Tandy Beal and Joan Lazarus, and an investment of thousands of hours in rehearsals, which were demanded by Frank Zappa before he'd let any orchestra play his music. That's absolutely right, and I think it's also fair to mention and fair to state that Kent Nagano, I'm sure, would and did demand um, every, every one of those hours of rehearsal from his orchestra before he would present it, because he is indeed a perfectionist, as is Frank Zappa, and uh, as Kent says, that's one of the reasons that they work so well together. I loved watching them in rehearsal, because Kent is so precise about rehearsal cues and, and going over and over particular passages where he heard minute details that were out of sync. And Frank, from the audience, uh, seemed to watch the overall proceedings and the staging and have a number of really fascinating ideas to loosen up the dancers and to make the choreography even more uh, strange and bizarre. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I got the impression from talking to Kent this past week that um, Frank had a similar impact on the polishing of the music. Um, one thing that I found fascinating was the fact that Kent said he harassed Frank to come to the rehearsals. This started, oh, about two weeks ago. And then once Frank was there, Kent had the orchestra play the things that were the most ragged. He didn't want Frank to just hear what was polished at any given time. He wanted him to hear the worst so that he himself could be a part of the solution and offer suggestions because, as uh, we've alluded, this music is extremely difficult and we'll be going more into this, the specific specifics of that and the difficulties of it later on. Frank Zappa has been writing orchestra music since he was 14 years old, but he's never heard his orchestra music uh, really properly until last year when Kent Nagano went to London to record some of these pieces you'll hear tonight with the London Symphony Orchestra. And these recordings have been released on Zappa's own label, Barking Pumpkin. But uh, in addition to these, uh, great uh, label. <laughs> in addition to these four or five pieces, uh, he has produced a body of works that includes 203 songs, 35 record album releases in the pop and, and rock field. Many of them are double and, sing and triple record sets. 91 instrumental works, 32 compositions for orchestra and choral groups, four ballets, two feature films, and two television specials. That's amazing. I think most people have no idea that he has that much to his credit. He doesn't sleep an awfully lot. <laughs> he seems to be the kind of person who simply works all the yeah, time yeah. and uh, is, is uh, very dedicated to the um, uh, production of these pieces and to doing them as best he can. And I have talked with musicians who have played with him and, 
and, and they're astounded at what they can come up with just because he demands it and they work at it and they finally get it and uh, mm -hmm. many people say he's one of the great musicians of our time. Well Kent said too that um, quite often um, he, <laughs> we're going to have to apologize to our <laughs> listeners for this amazing noise that happens in this booth periodically. Uh, it, it's not part of Zappa's music, believe us. <laughs> um, what I was going to say is that, that Kent was particularly impressed um, with the extent to which Kent, uh, Frank knows his own music inside and out, and that's not always the case with premier music. Um, Kent, Kent was really inspired to find that Frank knew exactly what was supposed to happen where and could help be part of the solution. You know, one thing that I think we should do, Charles, before we launch into the music is give our listeners a sense of what it looks like down there because I have never seen Zellerbach so packed full of musicians in the pit. The uh, orchestra completely uh, takes up the entire pit but then rolls up onto the stage on the left side with string basses, harp, own martineau, and piano, among other elect electrified instruments. And then on the right-hand side, eight percussionists, about... Uh, four of them are actually on on the stage with uh, the timpanist alone having six timpani it's it's an amazing ensemble and you will hear in this music that the orchestration is really a lot of the fun of Frank Zappa's music that is true now there are 112 musicians of this orchestra um, the regular musicians of the Berkeley Symphony of course um, plus musicians taken from the Oakland Symphony Orchestra I understand the Oakland Symphony Ballet Orchestra and uh, other orchestras around the area Kent was pleased to be able to say that despite the unusual instrumentation of some of these Zappa works and uh, despite the real virtuosity required um, he wasn't afraid when he saw the score he looked at it and given the repertoire that the that the Berkeley Symphony has played over the past several seasons uh, they were pretty well equipped to jump into it. It's a great ensemble and they do play a lot of music that involves electronics and uh, large orchestrations, the Messe Am pieces which have made the orchestra famous among them and uh, we're very excited that uh, we're being able to cooperate with KQED and bringing this music to you this evening over KPFA. The first piece is called Bob in Dacron, Sad Jane. It's really two different pieces and the uh, choreography is uh, not to be believed. It's a, uh, a sad thing that this is not on television. It's, it's sad, and yet uh, if it were, I, I think we'd be hard-pressed to stay on the air uh, after it aired. Um, it, there is some pretty amazing stuff going on on stage. Frank Zappa will be out in just a few minutes to talk about the music itself, so there isn't a great deal that we have to do there. But we should say that uh, the puppeteers and, and some of the visuals going on in this production are quite striking. Um, the amazing costumes that Bob puts on are, are really a laugh. The puppets that come out as part of uh, the visualization of the ideal women are, are very striking and uh, they move along, uh, well, in a very funny way. The uh, uh, stage set at the beginning has uh, a couple of racks of clothing that uh, Frank Zappa will talk about, but suffice it to say that it looks like they've raided a thrift store in Central Texas and uh, you will see the, the most bald uh, and bold plaid uh, coats in bright reds and greens uh, that have ever been uh, collected. And this man who dresses up in polyester to catch a girlfriend uh, <laughs> has, a, has a real uh, repertoire from which he can choose. And, and you'll hear laughter throughout the orchestra music, which is uh, one thing that Frank says has made him happy about seeing people laugh mm -hmm. at an orchestra concert. Yeah. He said it should have happened a long time ago. <laughs> so as you listen to this, you can certainly let your imagination run wild. I don't think you run any risk of uh, letting it go too wild. No, and the odd thing is that a lot of the music sounds quite serious and, and not at all satirical or humorous. It mm -hmm. sounds very much like Zappa, as he said on some occasions, has been influenced by Edgar Varese and uh, many other 20th century masters, including Boulez and Stockhausen. And this, mixed with his rock and roll background, has created a unique mix, which uh, is a pleasure to hear. I don't know how much uh, detail Frank will go into. Let, let me just run down the list of characters here in case he doesn't hit them all. We have, of course, Bob, then the three imaginary women, Dolly, Olivia, Flash, a tennis instructor, a doctor, a shoeshine boy, a bartender, and then the mysterious Jane, bag lady turned something else, and I think you'll hear about that later on. Uh, all of these controlled by a number of uh, live dancers, in many cases more than one dancer to a puppet. Uh, quite an amazing feat of staging, and here is Frank Zappa. Good evening. Yeah. 
If you're still out in the lobby, hurry up and get in here. The show's going to start in a minute now. And the first number is called Bob and Dave Brown and Sad Jane. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of uh, what's going on on stage. This is a piece of entertainment derived from the idea that middle-aged guys like to dress up in really ugly clothes before they go out to find some pussy. <laughs> and when they find it, they don't really know what to do with it. But this guy, Bob, you'll, when you see Bob in his lovely costume and his tall hair, you'll know right away that there's, you'll have no doubt that this man is, deep down, a Republican. <laughs> And, just so that everybody gets a fair chance here, every piece of clothing hanging on the rack was designed by the Democrats. <laughs> the girls who will appear in the first movement aren't really there. They are imaginary girls. These are the kinds of girls that a guy like Bob has in his imagination. These are the kinds of girls that would respond favorably to a man wearing clothes that look like that. <laughs> After Bob dresses himself with the approval of the imaginary girls, he goes to kind of a bar. Kind of a, well, actually, something else happens. He gets advice on, uh, he has this ugly body. Uh, he gets advice on the care and maintenance of his body from a doctor, a tennis instructor, and a shoeshine boy. <laughs> then he goes to the bar and he makes a fool out of himself. And after that, he gets thrown out of the bar. And he does find a girl. He meets a bag lady. Her name is Jane, and she doesn't have any face. <laughs> and she's not too attractive. And just when he, he thinks that he's going to be out of luck for tonight, he uses his imagination. And suddenly, Jane is naked. And she ain't too bad, even though she doesn't have a face. And then we have the big surprise ending. Thank you. And that, of course, was Frank Zappa leading into the uh, performance of the first work on this program with Kent Nagano and the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra, Bob and Dacron, Sad Jane. This work received its U.S. premiere. Yeah, tonight receives its U.S. premiere in Zellerbach Auditorium. And now here is Kent Nagano receiving the applause of the audience here in Zellerbach, and we will hear Bob and Dacron, Sad Jane.
the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra, led by music director and conductor Kent Nagano, in the U.S. premiere here at Zellerbach Auditorium of Bob and Dacron, Sad Jane by Frank Zappa. The scenes were Bob's clothes, what Bob's body is really like. Bob gets drunk and Bob meets Jane, Jane's clothes, and what Jane's body is really like. And the audience here in Zellerbach Auditorium had little left to its imagination. Well, we uh, hit our first pubic hair tonight, and it looks like we're in for more as we have an evening of Frank Zappa's music. Uh, the um, Berkeley Symphony sounds wonderful tonight, and it's mainly because they've had a lot of time to rehearse these pieces. The uh, uh, exceptional amount of rehearsal time required to play them, them right has been given to the music and we have an orchestra of over 110 musicians on stage right now uh, we're having a short intermission before which we'll have the American premiere of Mo and Herb's Vacation this is a piece which essentially is a concerto for clarinet and orchestra and the young man performing the clarinet part is a very special musician from Los Angeles who's also a composer his name is David Ocker David was born in Detroit in 1951, studied at Carleton College in the Midwest, and then at Cal Arts with composers Earl Brown and Mort Zabotnik, and with clarinetist Richard Stoltzman. He's played Frank Zappa's music since the mid-1970s. David, many people I know want, want to know about your involvement with Frank Zappa, but particularly I'm curious to know about the evolution of the orchestral piece by Zappa called Mo and Herb's Vacation. Well, um, for almost seven years now, I've worked for Frank. I started out being his uh, music copyist, and I've gone through a variety of uh, different stages doing technical musical things for him, producing scores and parts, uh, doing some orchestration. Um, now what I do is uh, work on his uh, computer uh, synthesizer, a synth uh, And it, when I went in, when I first met the man, the first day I worked for him, he had heard about me for, from some musicians who knew me and who worked for him. And he said to me that, um, I hear you're a pretty good clarinet player. And I looked at him and said, yeah, I can play anything that you can write. Which, at that moment, wasn't true. But it was some, something that I wanted to be true. And over the few years, I have been able to make that statement a true statement. And um, later on, um, I made an arrangement with him to have him write me a piece, a solo clarinet piece, just me and the audience is what I wanted. And he produced um, a melody line called Mo and Herb's... Well, it's, first it started out being just Mo's Vacation, it was. And it's, um, later, he heard it, I played it for him. He decided it needed a little more, so he added a drum part and a bass part. He called that Herb's Vacation. And if you played the drum part with the clarinet part and the bass part, then it was Mo and Herb's Vacation. But he decided he needed some harmony, so he added three more clarinets and four bassoons that, that play along in the harmony part. And then he decided that well, it needed to develop a little more. So he had another piece, which was titled... Oh, don't ask me to spell that over the air. Um, and he made that a, a second movement of the piece. It was for full orchestra. And then he proceeded to write a third movement, an extremely um, complex movement, using material from what was originally Moe's Vacation, Mo and his Vacation, and from this piece called Oh, and, uh, he, uh, and, and kind of a collage technique that he, he uses often, um, and it turned out to be um, a 25-minute concerto for a 100-piece orchestra and clarinet, and I've been fortunate to have opportunities to play the world premiere in London with the London Symphony, and um, just this evening, the U.S. premiere uh, with the Berkeley Symphony. The uh, piece is extraordinarily difficult for a clarinetist. Do you think that, that uh, given the fact that there are so many instrumentalists required and such a difficult clarinet part, that there's a future for the piece? I'm not even going to say that. I mean, when I first, when the score was first finished, I never thought it would be performed. I certainly never performed anywhere near as accurately as it, as it has been. So uh, we're already farther than I expected to be. Any, uh, uh, anything you can tell us about how um, the uh, relationship with Frank Zappa has influenced your composing? More than influencing my composing, which I don't think it's done a lot, it has influenced my musicianship tremendously. Uh, Frank Zappa is without question the best musician I've ever met, and he demands the ultimate musicianship from the people around it. And um, the number of things that I've learned to do because I've had to do them for Frank are extreme. Um, and in that sense, 
Working for him has been the best education that I've ever had, better than the formal education that I had um, before that. That was composer and clarinetist David Ocker, who will be soloist in Mo and Herb's Vacation, coming up next on our broadcast. You know, Charles, I, when I was um, speaking with Kent earlier this week, I guess it was just a couple of days ago, I asked him about David Ocker because I knew apparently far little than you do at this point, and, and Kent said, uh, well, David Ocker is Frank Zappa's personal clarinetist. <laughs> He's also his personal uh, orchestrator and copyist and has worked intimately with Zappa on a number of projects and really knows Frank's music uh, better than anybody. And also now, as you mentioned briefly in the interview, is working with Synclavier electronic pieces that Zappa has been doing quite a lot of lately. You avoid the uh, complications of working with performers. Zappa's been quite frustrated with the uh, inability of his music to be played because of its difficulty and his insistence on proper rehearsal time. And he is in a position uh, to insist on it because people want to play his music at the various uh, orchestras because it'll attract an audience as you see here tonight at Zellerbach with the full house and the second night in a row at that. Mm -hmm. So it's a demand that most composers can't make and consequently their music is rarely played to its fullest potential especially when it's uh, new and unfamiliar. And of course that all points to I suppose the priorities in the arts today. Um, it costs money to have the number of rehearsals that music like this requires and uh, well, the Berkeley Symphony was able to to pull it off. It's a, a semi-professional orchestra in the sense of only some of its musicians receiving uh, union scale. Um, nonetheless, it costs money and uh, they put it together and all in all, if you count the number of rehearsals with sections only, uh, there were 35 rehearsals for this, this performance. That's hard to believe, really. Uh, we talked with Frank Zappa l last May, actually, it was about a year ago, before these pieces were really scheduled properly by the Berkeley Symphony. They had just been played by the London Symphony and recorded and had not yet been released on Zappa's label, Barking Pumpkin. And here's a short excerpt from that interview. I have an image in, in my mind of a, a teenage Frank Zappa trying to reconcile these sort of what I think of as opposite forces, uh, sort of the visceral attraction of rock and roll and the, I can't even describe it, attraction of classical music. And, and somehow it seems to me that a lot of your musical life has been trying to reconcile these two. No, it's not However, really reconciling at all. I don't find any difference because in, in real good rhythm and blues, you have um, people telling you the truth. And in real good um, serious music, you have people telling you the truth. And the truth is the truth, no matter what kind of clothes it's wearing. And that's what I liked about it. And as far as classical music, the way you put it, and people might be thinking of Mozart and Beethoven and stuff like that, and I never cared for that kind of music. I always thought it was wimpy and uh, reminded me of people with uh, cuffs that were hanging out of their clothes and you know, ugly-looking wigs and stuff, and it didn't have anything that appealed to me. Whereas uh, the, the Rite of Spring uh, had a lot of balls, and so does the music of Barres, and there didn't seem to be compromise involved in, in those compositions. And I don't hear any compromise in a song like I Asked for Water, She Brought Me Gasoline by the Howlin' Wolf. To me, it's the same, same source of information. I was going to ask you if you wrote differently for classical music than you do for a rock and roll band, but I'm beginning to get the idea that you really don't. You just write music, and here's one set of clothes it wears, and here's another. Well, one of the best examples of that is going to be the third movement of Sinister Footwear, which in fact um, is a literal transcription of a guitar solo that I played at a concert in New York in 1980, transcribed by St Steve Vai, and then I orchestrated the uh, transcription. And that's what the whole third movement is, just a guitar solo. Uh, that, of course, is Rosemary Tobin, um, who spoke with Frank Zappa between rehearsals for this particular performance, uh, speaking in general terms about his appeal and the whys and wherefores, I suppose, of his appeal uh, to, to uh, classical, traditional classical musicians. A uh, Berkeley Symphony conductor, Kent Nagano, met Frank Zappa in the basement of the Berkeley Community Theater in between sets of one of Zappa's rock concerts. And by his own admission, Nagano was unable to make any sense of the score Zappa showed him during that first meeting and ended up with very bruised knees after several days of peeding out the complex rhythms used in the ballets. Uh, Nagano says the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra eats notes like Pac-Man <laughs> eats dots. They're very well used to the demands of contemporary classical music scores, as we've mentioned, but even so, the orchestra members did experience some initial discomfort during their rehearsals, as did the LSO. 
excuse me, the LSO, which Nagano conducted in a performance of the same, uh, the same music that we're hearing this evening. Um, nothing Zappa writes is impossible to play, but as the conductor explains, it does take some getting used to. Frank um, has exploited specifically the use of what we call irrational rhythms, using prime numbers, odd numbers, over and in relationship to another number. For example, 17 beats evenly spaced over 5 beats, or 13 beats evenly spaced over 2 beats, or 17 beats evenly spaced over 2 beats. And these are done in chain, one after another, so even though the meter re remains the same, 3, 4, 5, 8, uh, 6, 8, those meters that we're used to, the performer has to do various subdivisions that are, um, there's no other word for it, they're simply abnormal for us to, to comprehend. People aren't used to reading that, and it, develop, it demands developing a, a cognitive technique that we, we don't currently have. To say that there's some difficulty is putting it mildly. Um, when I was working in, in London, I, I remember the, when Frank and I first walked into the, to the rehearsal, bear in mind that I had never worked with Frank at this point before. And I didn't realize that wherever he goes, he normally wears a bright pink um, bathrobe and yellow shoes and um, uh, extraordinary looking pants. And I don't know, it, to me, it, it sort of took me by surprise and I'm sure it took the LSO by surprise when we met them and they were uh, sort of laughing and joking about his appearance and laughing and joking by the fact that there had been so many rehearsals slated in to work up this music. Because this group is a, is a fantastic group. They, they make their living through sight reading. So we started with the most difficult piece, and um, and the uh, the diameter of the eyeballs began to expand to be as big as uh, saucers almost. But the the nice thing was at the very very end, the group was more than cordial towards uh, towards Zappa as a composer. They gave him uh, about the warmest ovation and um, and the warmest. Um, the encouragement in his composition career that I've ever seen an orchestra give anybody before. So I think, uh, I think they were convinced after all the sweat and and hassle of figuring out this music, they were convinced that it was um, it was worth the trouble and that the concert was a very very enjoyable one. I write a lot of music in three four. I've probably written as many waltzes as uh, anybody in Vienna ever dreamed up. I like the uh, time signature three four. However, it's subdivided in such strange ways that you'll, you'll never know that it's a waltz. Uh, I've written marches uh, in waltz tempo. But what happens inside of those bars is uh, rhythms that are more related to the way people talk than to the way machines work, which I find more natural than listening to machines. By the way people talk, do you mean fits and starts, ups and downs, all shades of colorings? What? Yeah, just like conversation, because I think that's uh, the way instruments ought to perform. They ought to talk to the audience. Once that technique has been mastered by the instrumentalist, that it makes it a lot easier for that instrumentalist to express himself, his own personality, through the instrument to the audience, rather than to adhere to some sort of metronomic regulations uh, that are almost the same as punching a time clock at a factory. That's the kind of rhythm you're dealing with in uh, ordinary classical music, where it's all very rigid with an occasional uh, tempo rubato that, like, that is roughly the equivalent of uh, the afternoon coffee break when everybody wishes they would go home. In my music, you have a constant tempo most of the time, and inside of each bar, there's flexibility of the, the melodic line, which is notated by putting brackets over groups of notes and saying this many notes in the space of that many notes, which gives the effect of uh, the line will speed up momentarily and then slow down momentarily all inside of a, a fixed time signature that could allow you to tap your foot if you were so disposed. In reviews that I've read it's been described that uh, clarinets wail, horns, blat, violins, shriek, scream and moan and uh, are these the expressions that you're looking for or that you search for or, or indicate on your scores you want to hear these horns talk more clearly? No. The indications in my score do not say shriek, moan, and blat. They say things like smart sando, which is a musical term which means in a humorous manner. Or um, 
Uh, like last night at the rehearsal, I told the sax section, which is in Sinister Footwear, to use corny vibrato in the, in the realm of ace cannon so that they got a specific effect. But generally speaking, when the, there's a large group of instruments that are supposed to be playing at the same time making a chordal sound, I want it to sound like a chord and not like a, a Cuisinart. You are a serious musician. Whatever genre you're writing in, you're attempting to speak musical truth, if that's not too pretentious sounding. I mean, the point... Well, it certainly is. It's uh, incredibly pretentious. No, I, and it's also pretentious sounding to, to say, oh, you are a serious music. It's uh, differentiated from what? I mean, I do what I do uh, for entertainment purposes, and uh, there's a lot of craftsmanship in it. And that's probably the most serious aspect of it. But the basic idea, whether it's a piece for an orchestra or a chamber ensemble or a rock and roll band, is somebody should be entertained by it, preferably me. And then if anybody agrees with my point of view, then they will be entertained also. Frank Zappa talking with Rosemary Tobin, NPR producer, who is a friend of KPFA and KQED, and would like for me to point out to you that Frank doesn't always wear a pink bathrobe and yellow shoes, only when it seems appropriate. This broadcast of A Zappa Affair with the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra is a production of KQED-FM in cooperation with KPFA. And now here's Frank Zappa to introduce Mo and Herb's Vacation. Sorry for the delay, folks, but you know how this backstage. No problems. Okay, <clears throat> we're now getting ready to do Mo and Herb's Vacation. First of all, I'm going to introduce David Ocker, who will be playing the clarinet solo. Now, this is a very difficult piece of music. Bob and Jimmy was real easy. This one's hard. The one after this is maybe twice as hard as this one. So watch out where you land, because you can startle these people, wrong notes all over the place. <laughs> but please feel free to laugh, because remember, this is entertainment. We're not talking art here. This is entertainment. <laughs> We're looking at the world's most extensive vaudeville orchestra. <laughs> and now about the plot of Moan Herb's vacation. You got these two guys, one of which pretends periodically to play a clarinet. The other guy pretends to be entranced with what he hears. <laughs> they get so excited that they dance around a lot. This makes them very tired. They fall asleep on a fake tree. <laughs> then they have the same dream. They dream about these two gossamer twins that come whizzing out during the second movie. And then they dream about these guys called the Gilgamesh brothers who represent their dream state alter egos who are in hot pursuit of the gossamer twins. They're looking for the same type of illicit gratification that Bob sought in our first number. <laughs> in the midst of this, a hideous monster appears, called the Decamorph. <laughs> this monster is pretty hideous. You'll like it a lot. <laughs> then, and the ones who were here last night know what I'm talking about. Then, there's this little uh, battle scene and Something bad happens to the monster. And in the third movement, you get to see the wives of these two guys who are dancing really hard and getting hot over the clarinet and the Gossamer Twins. Their wives appear. Now, in the original story, we had these 18-foot statues which represented the wives as they sort of imagined themselves. But we had a problem. This is entertainment only insofar as you will be entertained. Otherwise, it's the world of art, which means that it's underfunded. And so, although these statues were constructed, they didn't have enough manpower to finish them off in time for the show tonight because all the available painters and carpenters were working for a democratic convention. And this is true. So you're going to have to imagine that we had these big things they opened up, and that the big things had horrible, ugly toenails on them. The husbands in this one part of the story were supposed to buff the horrible, ugly toenails of their wives. They're doing some buffing in there, but it's hard to, it's hard to tell what they're doing. 
because the wires are a little smaller now. Not quite as exciting and not quite as ugly as the big ones, but we've got them in there. So if you have the Mo and Herb humiliating themselves before their wives, and the wives loving every moment of it, and demanding to be taken on a vacation to Pamplona, which is a town in Spain that for a long time has this festival that they do where they let the bulls loose in the street, and the peasants run around, and the bulls chase them and die. And often, American record company executives and former managers like to go to a place like this and watch the peasants being badly injured by these large animals. In our presentation tonight, while this is going on, the wives of Moe Kerr will groom themselves and drink champagne while the peasants are being mutilated. There are also a couple of beauticians involved in this. Now last night we had a problem, the beauticians didn't get out there in time. I told everybody they were coming, I think tonight they're going to do it because the little car is going to be on the side of the stage over here, there won't be a problem. So watch for it at the end of the show, just before it goes black and the curtain comes down, the beauticians and the little silver car, thank you very much. Now we await the appearance of conductor Kent Nagano, who will lead uh, the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra in a work which is almost 30 minutes long. It's called Mo and Herb's Vacation. The composer is Frank Zappa.
You've heard the American premiere performance of Mo and Herb's Vacation by Frank Zappa. Kent Nagano conducting the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra here at Zellerbach Auditorium on the evening of June 16th, 1984. And we should say that the bus did make it on stage. And you know, Charles, our listeners are probably just a little bit curious about that decamorph uh, that Frank mentioned. What us. a monster. <laughs> Indeed. Well, you know, it came out of the stage, and I don't want to leave our listeners in the dark. So about that decamorph. <clears throat> it's an amazing, huge, undulating conglomeration of assorted body parts. And let's just say we're not talking eyes and ears and noses here, okay? And when Frank says that something bad happens to the decamorph, he means that the Gilgamesh brothers take their swords and lop off a couple of parts, highly prized and oversized <clears throat> masculine parts, components of any well-constructed decamorph, and after that, it seems there's nothing left for the decamorph to do but collapse in a heap and die. It was a uh, monster that must have been 20 or 25 feet wide. It, uh, the the uh, thing was so real, that rubbery surface with those strange spray-painted colors. Let's get into it. Oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> Just amazing. <laughs> Only... manned, by, manned or peopled by about 10 persons, I, I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah, at least. And it moved uh, beautifully. It was one of the highlights of the evening, I think, so far. You're listening to A Zappa Affair with the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra. This is a production of KQED-FM in cooperation with KPFA, and we invite you to listen to the rebroadcast of this program on KQED 88.5 FM on Monday, August 13th at 8 p.m. We'd like to thank our technical director from KQED, Jack Bad, and our broadcast engineer from KPFA tonight is Jim Bennett. The uh, uh, KPFA uh, radio station, the uh, one half of this production, is in the midst of a fundraising drive this evening, and as many of you know, we are a listener-sponsored non-commercial station. And I suppose, Catherine, you have the same uh, uh, problem over at KQED. You like to get people to subscribe to your station, right? We absolutely must, and we've been very fortunate in having our listeners respond. I hope you have the same good fortune as I understand uh, you do. Well, we've, ha we've been doing so, so far quite well, and we're trying to raise $100,000 in pledges. Our, our number to call if you'd like to help sponsor this and other broadcasts of KPFA is 848-5732. That's in Berkeley, so you have to dial area 415 to get it, 848-KPFA. And the amount of subscription pledges to listener-sponsored Pacifica Radio uh, range from $20 for our low-income subscription to $100 for what we call a sustaining subscription. We also have the rate at which most people subscribe, which is the regular rate of $40, when you call 848-5732, just give us your name and address and the city in which you live, your zip code, your phone number, and the amount of your pledge, and we'll send you a bill. When you pay it, you'll begin receiving 12 months of our program guide, which is 32 pages of photographs and information about the programs on KPFA. We need your support, and we hope you'll go to the telephone and help sponsor the broadcast. Once again, the number is 848-5732. We're in area code 415. The other subscription rates are $60 for a family or group subscription to the station, or you can pledge a uh, Bill of the Month Club membership, which is $10 per month. And all of this goes to ensure that KPFA's news and public affairs and music and drama and literature and Third World Department and Women's Department programs continue to be broadcast throughout uh, Northern and Central California. If you're in the Fresno County area, you can call 264-8888 and subscribe that, uh, to that station, KFCF, which rebroadcasts our signal and which is sponsored by the Fresno Free College Foundation. 264-8888 in my hometown, Fresno. Have you ever been there, Catherine? In Fresno? Yeah. I think I have passed through, but I've heard good things about it. Well, it's not, not the kind of place it. you'll see much <laughs> if you pass through on the highway because all the good stuff is off the road. Oh. And in fact, uh, as most cities these days, I think uh, the... Um, uh, urban sprawl is sort of taking over all of the uh, wonderful fig garden area and some of the uh, uh, wonderful grape growing areas that make Fresno so unique. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a great place though for uh, listener sponsored radio to be available because when I was growing up it wasn't there and I can tell you that it must be a wonderful thing for people in Fresno County to have it. So yeah. once again the number is 264-8888. 
uh, 2648888 in Fresno, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Well, uh, Charles, we are, as you say, broadcasting live on KPFA, the rebroadcast to happen on KQED FM on August 13th, 88.5. And uh, we're in the midst of an intermission break here in Zellerbach Auditorium. When uh, Kent Nagato and the orchestra return, we'll hear the world premiere, not only the American premiere, but the world premiere of uh, Frank Zappa's Sinister Footwear. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing that again. I've heard it a few times, and each time it's more fascinating to me. It's a three-movement work, and it uh, is one of the most complicated that Zappa has produced so far. He was very anxious to hear it uh, for himself, I'm sure, because it, it simply hasn't been done elsewhere. And that's what's coming up next on A Zappa Affair. We'd like to mention also our thanks to Stephanie Zimmerman, who really produced and organized this event and who uh, put together uh, uh, John Gilkerson, the puppet uh, man from the San Francisco Miniature Theater, with Kent Nagano and with Frank Zappa when their plans for a ballet, which was the original plan, fell through because of costs and so forth. So uh, our thanks also to the Berkeley Symphony and, and to KQED for letting us participate in this exciting evening. We'd like to play you now uh, something promised earlier, which is a bit of an interview with Frank Zappa as he discusses the relationship of his rock and roll music to his symphonic music. Could you tell us what's uh, very different about writing an orchestra piece from writing your usual music? Um, and the, the rock and roll stuff that I do, although it's uh, composed, uh, some of the elements that are in the piece are non-specific. In other words, uh, if a, if a song is a track supporting a vocal with spaces in it for solos, you don't necessarily have to write down every note that's going to be played because there's a, a common coinage among the musicians where you know that a certain type of rhythm is going to be there, and so you don't have to write it out. And, you know that the bass part will be thus and such, and you just hum it to them, and then, you know, it's a lot faster to put those kind of things together. Whereas with the uh, other pieces, everything's specified. And if they play it right, then everything comes out uh, fine and dandy. With rock and roll, you take your chances, because even if you do specify every note that's being played, the chances are that the rock and roll musicians will not play it exactly the way you wrote it because, uh, especially on stage, because when the blue lights go on and the teenage girls are screaming out there, then everybody suddenly decides to make up their own version of what you wrote. And uh, that usually generates uh, a lot of uh, ill will in the dressing room after such a thing has occurred. I don't take too kindly to having my songs murdered. Those masked sonorities that you can get with an orchestra uh, are certainly different also when you're writing an orchestra piece. I mean, it's wonderful to be able to, to play with that kind of uh, um, large sound. Um, well, you can make an orchestra sound large. I don't think an orchestra ever will sound as large as a rock and roll band, four pieces with you know, their amps turned all the way up. I mean, that's a large sound, but on a record, you can do things that... Uh, make an orchestra sound mighty. I'm usually quite dismayed at how tiny orchestras really do sound. You can make them sound great on the record, but live in person, unless you've got fantastic acoustics, to me they always sound uh, less impressive than they should. Usually less impressive than what's specified in the orchestral scores. You know, when you see three or four Fs on the page, you want to hear some Fs coming out, and they don't. <laughs> unless it's on record. So, uh, what approach did you take to, to mixing this album? Obviously, you're doing something different from the normal orchestra recording. Well, first uh, thing that I did was um, I had to edit it a lot because the number of uh, accurate takes of, of certain bars was uh, somewhat limited. So I spent a lot of time piecing things together. Then after I pieced it together, the proportions uh, were balanced out as close as I could get them uh, to what the uh, score called for. There were some instances where certain instruments that should have been louder just didn't come out loud enough in, uh, on any of the tracks, most of which are ambient, to uh, make the balances right. But I would say with the budget that I had and the time uh, that I spent working on the thing, I got pretty close on 
most of the pieces. I think that the listener will be able to get an idea of what the things are supposed to sound like. There's some moments in uh, various instrumental parts, percussion, let's say, a cymbal, which is, is being beaten uh, in a steady rhythm, where it bounces back and forth between channels. How did you do that? Well, it's quite possible he's playing two cymbals, and one of them's on the left and the other one's on the right. And uh, there's other places where uh, there's a uh, small rototom, which he hits, and then the uh, sound ricochets back and forth. That's part of the reverb program that I built uh, into the uh, Lexicon 224X. That device lets you uh, specify your own acoustics. You can build around and make it do what you want. So what you're doing with these records is different from the way we would hear these orchestra pieces in a concert hall. Well, first of all, you'll never hear them in a concert hall because nobody will ever play them in a concert hall. Secondly, uh, the approach that I'm taking is like electronic music. I mean, science has come a long way since the phonograph was first invented, and I think that all those nice tools that are normally used for making rock and roll records and, and other types of pop music uh, there's no reason not to use them on an orchestral recording. So that's what I did. I wonder if you could uh, give any uh, reflections on, on uh, your interest in Varese's music and how it, how it might have influenced some of these pieces. Well, I like uh, the approach that he took to organizing sound. And uh, I've always felt that he had a lot of the correct answers to the blank page problem, which everybody has to come to grips with, whether you're a writer, whether you're a composer, you get an empty piece of paper and then you have to put something on it that will eventually convert into entertainment. And I've been uh, entertained by what he did, but the, the techniques that he used in his compositions were more to the point than other um, solutions, so I use those. Frank Zappa discovered Edgar Varese and his music via a recording that was issued by the Elaine Music Shop on EMS Records in the 50s. Finally found it and uh, took it home. He used to play it in his room every night two or three times with the door locked and uh, this no doubt influenced the kind of music you're hearing tonight, although he says it's entertainment. It sounds quite serious if you're listening over the radio. What's going on in the concert hall here at Zellerbach Auditorium is uh, quite extraordinary and exciting and funny on stage with the puppets of John Gilkerson. I'm Charles Amerikanian of KPFA, and with me is Catherine Lumens from KQED-FM. Yes, and in just a few minutes, there go our Stop sound that, Catherine. Stop <laughs> that. Sound effects in the band. I've got to wear, We've got got stop wearing these dangling earrings. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we are soon going to be hearing uh, Sinister Footwear, as Charles mentioned. This is um, definitely, uh, I think it's safe to say, the most complex uh, for the musicians, the most challenging piece of music that we're hearing tonight. And the action on stage is, is uh, probably the most intricate, too. We've got a real storyline going. And uh, we'd like to let you in on a little bit of the action before it happens. So, uh, uh, Charles, should I just run down the scenes here, the parts? Can you uh, read all of those? Oh, I think I might be able to make <laughs> them out. We start out here with a part one. We meet Jake who designs these shoes, these sinister shoes. We meet him in the studio, which is sort of an austere place, and he's putting the finishing touches on this amazingly ugly pair of shoes. He uh, runs off to somewhere in New Jersey where they make them, and at that point on stage, there is a, a dance of factories. The, you know, we see these uh, beautifully constructed factories doing a little dance around the stage. We see them inside and out. Then in come the people who are going to make these shoes, and who would these people be but illegal aliens. So we meet the illegal aliens coming in in a line, and they are they, these are puppets controlled from behind they by the dancers. They look like Muppets to me. They do. They look like Muppets. Yeah. Maybe yeah. another parody going on here. <laughs> so they set up at the assembly line, and what happens then? Well, then, uh, of course, they have lunch. Uh, I don't know why at that point they have lunch, but they do go out to the catering truck where a big jumbo gym, I think it is, uh, feeds them lunch, and their mouths open up widely. We see their teeth, and they clamp down on these uh, tasty morsels of who knows what. 
uh, Jake himself eats a molded jello salad and he does a very intricate dance with this jello salad. I'd better whip along here because I think we'll be seeing Frank himself pretty soon. We meet Jake, uh, Jake's uh, secretary, not an unattractive woman by any stretch of the imagination. Then we see the illegal aliens uh, working slower in the afternoon. The lights dim and they kind of run down. Jake's secretary reads her magazine. The illegal aliens want to go home. Jake's secretary on a diet, of course, eats her cottage cheese. We see the ugly shoes on the assembly line and these, uh, I think, we can safely say resemble uh, purple and yellow Adidas. Is that, is That's that what they look like, yeah. I mean, I don't want to use a brand name here. Forget I said Adidas. It could be any running shoe. It could be Nike. Yeah, I mean, just figure some commercial product that someone wants to push. And, and that everybody wants to wears, yeah, right. That's right, yeah. Uh, if I get interrupted, you know, don't worry. I'm sure Frank's going to talk about this. But, um, and here he is. So let's let Frank Zappa talk about Sinister Footwear. what you think you look like when you're wearing them. Sometimes they make you walk funny. Other people pretend not to notice. Sometimes you have to take them off for a minute, then you put them back on because they think they look good. And uh, here comes Kent Nagano. I don't want to step on the music, so we'll tell you about the rest later. Kent Nagano and the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra in Frank Zappa's Sinister Footwear.
will now pretend to be entranced by an incredibly ugly shoe. Go for it, Carol, that's right. Give her hints. Ask her to do something with the shoe. She is not shy. No, don't take the shoe. No, no, no. Maybe he's a sniffer. Okay. Now she's supposed to be in trance with the shoe. She now offers it to members of the orchestra who feel that the shoe is not their cup of tea. Twirl more. That's more like dancing. Twirl a lot. Twirl several times. That's very graceful. I, her father is here tonight. I originally asked her to show part of her house to him. <laughs> but that would be very interesting, right? That's right. Now she's going to give the shoe in a love offering to Peter the Tiffinist. That's right. He's hypnotized. He's taking the shoe, and you're breaking the spell.
The Berkeley Symphony Orchestra, led by music director and conductor Kent Nagano, in the world premiere performance of Sinister Footwear by Frank Zappa. I promised that I would tell you what the action was that I didn't have a chance to describe. I hope by now you... No, I won't do that. So we have to entertain him. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something that's never been done before. But first, we have to do something that should have been done a little while ago, which is uh, give him a present. I uh, wonder if it's ready back here. Have, have they obtained the object in question yet for uh, the Tempest? Are they still working on it? Oh, it's so tough when you're underfunded. Okay, tonight, as you might have noticed already, the music that I write is very boring and old-fashioned and literally unfunded. But we're going to stop all that during this four-minute interlude and do something incredibly modern, something up-to-date, something really 80s and relevant. We are going to premiere a piece that I'm going to compose right here on the stage, and it's going to be very, very minimal. And the orchestra will cooperate because it's in their best interest to fill this black hole. So, Here's what you do. Each section, and you know who you are, get to choose one note. <laughs> this incorporates the aleatoric element into the composition. For reliability, we limit it to one note so that there is no chance there will be a mistake. And it's got to be one that's easy to play on this. You will also choose your own rhythm, something that won't confuse you. <laughs> when I give the signal, Different sections of the orchestra will play their favorite note on their favorite rhythm until everybody becomes tired of playing that note. <laughs> or until they're ready backstage, whichever comes first. Oh, here it is, wait. I have to give this to him. Frank Zappa is just handed a uh, five foot long penis to the Timpanis. Not enough, huh? Not enough, sure. No problem. There is a reason for doing this, which will eventually be revealed, and it's part of art, which takes place in Iron Curtain. Now, back to our exceptionally creative hole filler here. Along with this minimalist composition, which is going to be so tremendous that I expect funding from the Frome Foundation within a matter of nanoseconds of its release. <laughs> you and the audience are going to participate in the world's first minimalist aerobic exercise. <laughs> because this piece will stimulate you to do whatever it is that you're doing at the time, which constitutes minimalist aerobic activity. It's important that all of these things have an aim. So, there's no way for you to escape it. If you're just sitting there like a lump and breathing, you're in on this game. Okay, have you chosen your notes yet? I'm sure you have. Okay, here's the way. This little test is, those of you who can't see me underneath the uh, thing there, you just make it up as you go along. We'll begin with the bases. Okay, bases, are you ready? This is just a sample of how it works. I'll point like that, let's begin. Nobody else play unless you've been looked at and pointed to. And we can move the texture around the orchestra and get stereo. Are you ready? Okay, and it's the faces.
just heard a spontaneous minimal music composition by Frank Zappa with members of the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra conducted by the composer.
That short ending piece was Pedro's Dowry by Frank Zappa to close a Zappa affair with the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra conducted by Kent McDonald. And now on stage we have the two leading dancers of the evening, Paul Zmolek and uh, Robert Walker, joined now by other dancers of the cast. Those are the dancers, Catherine, that you couldn't see before because they've been costumed all night. There are uh, 12 of them all together, two of whom were male leads without costumes. It was an interesting combination. You sometimes forgot that the people without costumes uh, were without them. And here come two people very intimately involved with this production. We have Joan Lazarus, one of the choreographers. The other was Tandy Beale. She's not on stage, along with John Gilkerson, who designed the puppets. And here is David Ocker, the clarinetist, who has collaborated for many years with Frank Zappa. He appears on stage to take a bow for his participation in Mullen Hood's Vacation, a clarinet concerto by Zappa. And music director and conductor of the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra, Kent Nagano, who motions for the musicians of the orchestra to stand. Young Japanese-American conductor born in Morro Bay in 1951. He's made a sensation with the Berkeley Symphony with his performances this and in past years. That's right. He's been with the Berkeley Symphony for six seasons now, and when he joined the orchestra, changed the focus from pops to new and unusual music. We're waiting now the appearance on stage of Frank Zappa to take a bow. And here he is. We should also mention the production and design that was executed by the San Francisco Miniature Theater. Although our listeners couldn't hear it, it certainly was, or see it rather, it was, certainly was a part of the production. Choreography, as we said, by Tandy Beale and Joan Lazarus. Performance and staging by John C. Gilkerson. And lighting by Evan Parker. Those are the people who provided the uh, laughter in the background for you out there in the radio audience. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it. This broadcast of a Zappa affair with the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra was a production of KQED-FM San Francisco in cooperation with KPFA. Be sure to join us for the rebroadcast of this program on KQED-FM Monday, August 13th at 8 o'clock. That's at 88.5 FM. The technical director in charge of the music mix for KQED-FM and KPFA was Jack Vad. The broadcast engineer for KPFA was Jim Bennett. And as usual, KPFA has its interminable list of volunteer helpers, including Terry Hawkins, who's running this series uh, for KPFA throughout the summer, as we will hear more of the Berkeley Symphony on July 2nd, 9th, and 16th in special programs. We'd like to thank also Don Nagengast and Pamela Flash, and special thanks to Victor Ledeen, music director of KQED-FM, for allowing KPFA to participate in this exciting evening's events. We would also like to, of course, thank Frank Zappa, Kent Nagano, and the Berkeley Symphony Orchestra for making this radio affair possible. Thanks to Dick Patterson and the Zellerbach staff and to Stephanie Zimmerman for their help in putting it together and to Rosemary Tobin for her interviews used in the broadcast. Catherine, it's been fun doing this with you and with KQED, and we hope we can participate with you again on future broadcasts. Well, Charles, it's certainly been a pleasure for me as well. With Charles Armarkanian, I'm Catherine Lumens from Zellerbach Auditorium. The preceding program on KPFA was made possible in part by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And you are listening to KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno.